Good morning. I am Scott Morrow, and my pronouns are he, him. And I'm very glad to introduce to you uh, people that you already know. But first, I want to greet you and welcome you to this worship service. Is there anyone who is coming for the first time in a while or maybe the first time ever? I'm here for the first time in a while. Good. Welcome. <laughs> welcome. This is a special time, different from most other times of the week. It's a gift. It is part of a promise. It's part of a relationship to which we want to devote our energy and our intention so that we can increase our hope and our faith and our determination. Whoever you are or wherever you are in life's journey, you're welcome in our worship service this morning. I'm glad this morning to be serving with Deacon Carol Ann Bokuber. The junior deacon is Paige Abbott. The usher is Lynn Bowling. In the nursery are Lauren Abbott and Sydney Wren. During coffee hour, Karen Miller will be selling grocery cards. The minister of music is Linda Giuliani. The choir director is Bill Clemens. The minister of faith formation is Sue Timoney Hall. And I want to tell you that it's because of these staff that I feel particularly excited to be here today, most especially the choir and music. Because for a long time, I went to choir festivals and just waited through until the time came for North Madison. So now I can be here. So it is a joy. All right, I believe you have an announcement for the young people. Yes, I will take any kids that want to come downstairs and paint. We're going to be making reflective posts for the NFCC driveway. Oh, good. Out using light bulbs. For any of us just so Good morning. It's wonderful to be here with you this morning. My name is Carol Ann Bakuber, as you know, and my pronouns are she, her. Your presence enriches our time together. I hope our worship will be meaningful and inspiring to you and that you leave here transformed and more deeply connected to your own heart, to one another, and to our creator. September 21st, which is, was Wednesday of this last week, is observed as Nat International Day of Peace. The UN General Assembly, Assembly in 1981 declared this a day devoted to strengthening the ideals of peace around the world. This morning's gathering prayer seems appropriate as we reflect on a world that seems to need peace today more than ever. It was transmitted to millions around the globe by astronaut Frank Borman 55 years ago on Christmas Eve, 1968, while orbiting the moon in Apollo 8. Here is our junior deacon, Paige, to lead us in this gathering prayer. Give us, O oh God, the vision which you can see your love in the world in spite of human failure. Give us the faith to trust your goodness in spite of our ignorance and weakness. Give us the knowledge that we may use or may continue to pray with understanding hearts. And show us what each one of us can do to set forward the coming of the day of universal peace. Here we are, and we have just prayed for universal peace. So this is the moment now when 
We move from everything that's brought us here this morning, everything we had to remember, everything we were trying to forget. Now we move into a time of centered prayer and attention. So I invite you all to take a deep breath in and out. Take another deep breath and take a look out the window. Gentle rain, green leaves, abundant life. Take another breath in and out. And one final breath. As you breathe in, breathe in the grace of God. And as you breathe out, breathe out the last little bits of worry or hesitation so that you can be centered here in this place, in this moment. Loving God, thank you for this time together and your light and peace within us and among us as we worship you. Amen. As we bring our attention back to this room, I would invite the choir forward to offer our gathering song.
whole congregation of Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat and ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you. And each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way I will test them whether they will follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because God has heard us, has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what are we that you complain against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening, and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against him, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of, of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for God has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. <clears throat> Matthew. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a den denarius for the day, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again, about noon, about in about three o'clock, he did the same thing. And about in about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received a denarius. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, 
but each of them also received a denarius. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day, doing you no wrong of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this the last the same, as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. It's a tremendous joy for me to be here today. From my experience, the opportunity for an exchange of pulpits is an opportunity to meet people, to be in a new and vibrant place, and to feel the energy that that brings, and an opportunity to be a neighbor because all of us in the New Haven East Association are neighbors one of another. And our gathering of nine churches is important. It's important in our uh, support of each other. It's our, important in our guidance and assistance to fellow congregations, to those authorized for ministry. Um, and it's a part of the wider church, the, the closest, perhaps, part of the wider church. And it is a joy for me to be here with you in person. To see among you people who I have met and have known for some time. To have the opportunity to thank members among you who have given great and wonderful and valuable service to the Consociation and to the conference. Calvin Price, who serves as a treasurer, and Nora Price, who serves on the Committee on Church and Ministry for the Consociation, uh, of which I am a part, a group that guides those who are authorized ministers uh, in our churches in the Consociation and those seeking ordination in order to serve elsewhere. But beyond them, just the faithfulness of the congregation and the choir. Let us pray. Holy God, thank you for this opportunity to be gathered together. Help us to listen. And listening, help us to understand. And understanding, help us and guide us to serve, to be bearers of light and life and peace and hope to your people in this community and throughout the world. Amen. We heard first this morning from the book of Exodus, a story from the Hebrew scriptures that is a story of hunger, deep hunger and discomfort. Hunger and discomfort in the wilderness. This is a familiar story to most of us, but I suspect it may be one that we set at a distance. 
We all got up this morning to a drizzly day and made our way to church where we wanted to be, but we were all aware that it was a drizzly day. You know, the kind of day that we should get a little extra credit <laughs> for having come and gathered. Not an easy, joyful day to go off to church because of the need to protect ourselves from the raindrops and, and the breeze, the dampness and the cool. But we also hold this passage at a distance because it's about complaining. And why should we pay attention to other people's complaining when we have our own that we would like to get to? The people that we heard about are God's people, God's chosen people. The people we heard about are refugees. Through God's mighty acts, they have been able to leave an existence under slavery, to be freed from oppression and hardship that had bowed them down and ground them to the point that their constant crying reached God's ears and moved God to do something. So they've been let out of that situation, but now they're in the wilderness. We may tend to think of the wilderness as a beautiful place of forests and lakes, but the reality is this wilderness is more like a desert. It's lonely, resources are scarce, and it's dangerous. So the people are hungry, and they're worried, and they're angry. Are you trying to kill us by bringing us out here? It would be better to go back where, we, where the pots were filled by the fire and we could sit and eat in comfort than to be so hungry in this desolate, forsaken place. The response to all this complaining is a promise from God to provide meat and bread for all the people, even in the midst of the desert. And the story actually says at one point that the people can look across the barren wilderness and see the glory of God. Imagine what it is that they see. A brilliant light, maybe with some background music, <laughs> and a sense of hope and possibility in the most unlikeliest of circumstances, where they had already decided all was pretty much lost. And so the story says that in accordance with God's promise, quail fly in at night and nest, and they're able to harvest some of those to eat them. And in the morning when they wake in this strange, unfamiliar place, there's dew on the ground, and when that dries, there's some kind of a flaky substance left behind. Now, I don't know what you would say if you walked outside your front door and saw that in the morning. But these people, God's people say, what is this? The way that you say that in Hebrew is mana. And so it's called manna. Mana. 
God said that there would be enough for everyone each day. And on the sixth day, there would be twice as much, so there didn't need to be any gathering during the Sabbath. No one is denied. No one goes hungry. Everyone has what they need for the day. In the gospel lesson, Jesus tells a story about the owner of a vineyard who goes out to hire people to work. He starts early in the morning at six or seven and hires from those who are waiting to work. The story says that he goes out again and again through the day at nine o'clock, at noon, at three o'clock, at five o'clock, and still finds people hoping to be hired to do some work. He hires all of them and promises them a denarius, the usual daily wage. This is another story that's a little difficult to connect with because most of us are very clear about where our work is and where we need to go. It's waiting for us when we get there. We don't have to be hired every day, but there are some who do need that. There are some for whom the daily wage has to be negotiated every day. And they wait and wonder if someone will need the work that they can do and pay them for it so that they can survive and support their families. All of them are promised the daily wage, and when the time comes for them to be paid, the vineyard owner tells his uh, uh, manager to call them in, starting with those who were hired last. And so those who hired on at five and worked for an hour come and get their denarius. And then those who came at three and worked for three hours get their denarius. And then the ones from noon, and then the ones from nine, and finally the ones who've been there since six o'clock in the morning. All of them are paid what they agreed to work for, the usual daily wage. Now there is a difference between this story and the story from Exodus. In the story from Exodus, it's very clear that God is providing what is needed for the day. We can trust that God is doing that. It's not really clear whether the vineyard owner is paying what is sufficient for everyone, but at least it's the customary wage and everybody is treating the same. No one is cheated, no one is denied, Everyone gets what they agreed to have, but of course those who started earliest are upset. And the vineyard owner says to them, I gave you what I agreed to. It's my decision to pay those who started last the same as those who started first. Everyone got the usual daily wage. And then he says, are you envious because I am generous? The generosity of God is a challenge. It's a challenge for those of us who pay a lot of attention when we receive to what everybody else receives. We don't have a very good sense of enough. Our sense of enough is always informed by what everybody else has, and we're always looking around and <clears throat> comparing. It's interesting that when we pray each week, as the disciples were taught by Jesus to pray, we pray for our daily bread, our manna. There's no, uh, 
There's no efficiency version of that prayer that allows you to just go ahead and pray for the whole month's worth, you know, and so you could have that time to do something else. And there's no vacation mode where you can ask for a little bit extra because you're going to be traveling and busy with other things. Jesus taught us to pray for our daily bread each day. Another interesting aspect of this gospel lesson is the fact that all of the attention is paid to receiving the payment at the end, and whether it's fair or not. And that takes over everybody's thoughts and concerns and worries, and there's no mention of what that workday was like. Conversations between the laborers in the vineyard, whether there were pretty clouds going over or some bird songs. It's as if the work was just something to get through in order to get the reward. <coughs> and for some of us, that may be the case. But the poet Khalil Gibran has written that work can be and might be, and perhaps we'd like it to be, love made visible. And Frederick Beekner suggests that if we pray and work carefully and joyfully, then our work is not drudgery, but, but it's a vocation. Or as he said, it's where our deepest joy and gladness meets the world's greatest need. It's not always part of our work. Perhaps our work enables a vocation that we conduct at other times through our week. But these lessons challenge us to pray about and think about how much is enough? What do we, where's the line between what we need and what we want? And how often do our wants get hijacked and blown up because of a constant barrage of information telling us, well, we could have this, or we could try for this, or this is bigger, or this is better, or this is uh, 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 new. Let's take a week and pray and think and give thanks for daily bread, <coughs> for daily work, and each day look and see if we can pay attention and notice and be thankful and celebrate God's generosity. Amen. Amen. I invite you to take a moment of silence to let all of that talking settle. And now gently I'll interrupt your silence because I want to tell you something. Uh, this summer in May I had the opportunity to be in Arizona uh, for the celebration of the wedding of one of my wife's cousins. And during that time I was gifted to be able to visit and worship at the Church of the Red Rocks in Sedona, Arizona. Anyone have been there? Yes, we are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, for those of you that have it, I need to explain my enthusiasm. <laughs> so, just imagine that the front of the sanctuary here was, is a plate glass window 
And as you sit worshiping, you look right through that window, and across the valley are the red rocks, the buttes, and the towers, and all the different colors, right? Now, you don't have to do that because you can look at this sanctuary, which is a familiar and comfortable and sacred place, a fountain, a candle, a cross, the place where all of you come to be together. So what I want to tell you is, the pastor, the interim pastor at the Church of the Red Rocks, introduced the offering in this way. And we want to celebrate this moment in our worship because our offering is what enables our ministry and our mission and our community and far beyond. It's what goes from us into the gathered collection and then is sent out in so many different ways to touch so many different lives. Celebrate.
Thank you to the choir for that wonderful piece of music. This is a special time in our service when we speak aloud the prayer requests from those among us. Here are the concerns from Eileen McCann and Carol Ann Bockuber. That's me. Uh, please pray for our cousin Allison and her wife Valerie on the passing of Allison's father, our uncle Jack Young from Brantford, who died this week at the age of 90. It's a joy to have Reverend Scott Morrow with us this morning. And uh, the last joy that we have um, is to mention a few birthdays here. We've got Julie and Peter Half, and Tom and Jonathan. Anyone else have a birthday? Okay. And uh, so Jonathan's birthday is uh, the 29th on Friday, and we have a card and a gift for him. <laughs> God of grace and abundant love. We thank you for this time, for this gathering, for your invitation. We thank you for the opportunity to listen for your word, to take hold of it, and to take it with us as we go to share with others. We thank you that once again, through your grace, your steadfastness, your generosity, we could feel our shoulders lighten just a bit as we stepped into the church, leaving behind the arguments and the shouting and the worries that fill the airwaves, that fill the newspaper on the breakfast table, and that sometimes fill our own homes or offices. We thank you that arriving here feeling perhaps a bit weighed down, perhaps a bit discomforted by the weather, there were others waiting to worship and pray with us so that our prayers rise not only by our own efforts, but through the joy and the generosity of those around us. Hear all of our prayers, God, as we ask for healing, as we ask for comfort, as we ask for strength and faith, as we ask for peace, and as we ask for just the basic needs, the food and water and clothing and shelter for so many people in so many places of misery and danger. Watch over those who are traveling to find a new home Watch over those who are far away, defending their homeland. Watch over those who, as a matter of course, go into danger in order that we might live more safely together. And help us to think of, to dwell with, to take hold of your generosity. 
Bless the gifts we have offered and the intentions that we take into this week. And hear us as we pray together the prayer our Lord has given us to pray. Our fathering, mothering God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
friendship hall, one for food, another one for flowers, and one for breakfast at Columbus House. There's a book discussion. Join us this week on September 26 at 4.30 p.m. at the Grassy Knoll to discuss Jody Picoult's Mad Honey. That's with Peter Meyer. The Safe Conduct Policy Training is today after worship. If you are or are interested in working with our children and our youth, please plan to attend this mandatory training at 11.45. That's with Sue Timothy Hall. Connecticut Quest for Peace. We will receive donations from September 24th to October 29th. Please place, place your warm weather clothing in a bar, box or bag marked warm and cold weather clothing in a box or bag marked cold and deliver it to 7 Godman Road, Madison. The youth kickoff is October 1st. Pizza, community building games, and baking for Chapel on the Green. 5.30 to 7 in Fellowship Hall and outdoors. That's what Sue Timothy Hall. There's two more. Linda Young may want to announce the 19th annual Rosalind Young Memorial Concert. That's her sister. Um, quintessence. Music for clarinet and string quartet for Brahms and Weber. Sunday, October 9th at 4 p.m. at First Congregational Church in Madison. Rosalind Young, sister of Linda Young, grew up in Guilford performing on violin and viola at the Connecticut Early Music Festival in New York throughout the U.S. and Europe. Join the string quartet Circle of Friends for this concert and reception. Tickets are $20 at the door and under 18 are free. And there's a spirituality retreat. Imagination <coughs> is evidence of the divine. Come to the beautiful Mercy Center in Madison to explore the deep connection between spiritu spirituality and the arts, led by NMCC member Reverend Olivia Hayes Robinson, Tuesday, October 10th, 4 p.m. to after lunch. Uh, October 10th. It says 4 p.m. to after lunch. I don't understand that. Oh, to after lunch on Wednesday, the 11th. <laughs> Contact Olivia for um, information on that. That's all I have. <laughs> Thank you. So I don't want to wear out my welcome, <laughs> which has been very generous. But I want to make uh, a quick announcement. This is happening today, as I said, because of the consociation, the connection between us and eight other churches uh, in this area. And you should know that in October, on Sunday the 21st, will be the annual meeting of the consociation. And there are three important positions that need to be filled on that occasion. One is the position of the treasurer, the person who helps to put together the budget, handles the payments through the year, uh, and uh, answers questions on the occasion of the annual meeting. It's a much less complicated budgetary task than the conference or the church, probably or even in your household. <laughs> the second position is that of auditor, someone who takes the time to just double check the work of the treasurer in order to certify that for the group. The third position is that of registrar. The registrar is the person who keeps all the records of the consociation, most particularly the records for all of the clergy who are serving and active and those who are retired, who keeps the records for those who are in the process of, as members of discernment, seeking authorization to ministry, keeps the records of the work of the Church and Ministry Committee as it meets with uh, clergy and with churches, helping them to answer questions, to explore new resources, uh, to work together. It's a very important position. So I invite you to think about that. We can provide you with job descriptions. There are many gifts within this congregation and the others in the consociation. And this is a time when we need some particular gifts to help all of us. Thank you. And now, go from this place with determination. With determination to stay in prayer and in relationship. 
with the God who calls you and sends you. Work gently to understand just how much is enough and where the line between need and want is. Be gentle with yourself. Be gracious towards your neighbors. May the abundant grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the overflowing love of God, and the deep peace of the Holy Spirit fill you and abide with you this day and every day. Amen. Amen. Amen.